Welcome to today's program titled Reflecting on Equal Pay Day 2024, Assessing the International Equal Pay Landscape. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. For those of you who are logged in to the web presentation, you are encouraged to submit questions throughout the conference by typing them into the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. For those interested in obtaining CLE credit for this webinar, an attendance verification code will be read during the presentation that will be required on the CLE attendance affirmation form. Please write this code down as it will not be reread and it is required for CLE credit. Copies of the webinar recording and materials will be distributed to attendees in the days following the webinar and you can find the CLE attendance form attached to the connection details email you received this morning. On the next slide, you will see a legal disclaimer. This presentation has been prepared by Seifarth Shaw LLP for informational purposes only. The material discussed during this webinar should not be construed as legal advice or a legal opinion on any specific facts or circumstances. The content is intended for general information purposes only, and you are urged to consult a lawyer concerning your own situation and any specific legal questions you may have. At this time, I would like to turn it over to our first speaker for today's program, Annette Tymon. Annette, please go ahead. Thanks everyone and welcome. We are um, thrilled to be uh, kicking off the next hour talking about such an important topic um, and that is uh, equal pay uh, principles. Um, I am joined today um, by Caitlin Lane, who is a partner in our New York office, as well as Anna Sid. Uh, a partner out of New York and London. Um, I'm going to bring um, some of the concepts or issues from the U.S. perspective, and we are thrilled to um, present Caitlin and Anna, who are going to be um, sharing information about uh, what's happening across borders. Um, it is critically important to have that full perspective um, as you move through and think about what it means to have um, equal pay within your system. On the next slide, you'll see that there's a lot of other hands. This truly was a, a team effort in terms of the materials that we are sharing. So while Caitlin, Anna, and I are here presenting live, um, we have wonderful team members that really supported some of the materials that you're going to be getting today that we're really thrilled about. Matt Gagnon is a partner here in Chicago, and he is um, put together almost single-handedly um, an equal pay uh, update on litigation issues that we'll be sharing today. Christy Ayacapeta and Maria Papasavestos, also in New York uh, office, um, also put together a lot of the materials um, that we'll be sharing. Collateral materials are going to go alongside our webinar, as well as Joe Veli and Juanita Vera Trujillo um, from our, uh, she's in New York, but also providing that global context. So it really was a team effort to bring you what you'll see on the next slide is four new resources. If you've been attending our webinars, I believe this is our eighth year that we hold around this time, um, we're going to have uh, these resources available to you. We have our, for the U.S., the 50 State Equal Pay uh, Reference Guide uh, that shares a lot of information about what's happening at the state level. We're going to have two uh, resources on pay transparency uh, that just provides more detail about what's required when it comes to pay range disclosures. We'll have our updated resource guide on equal pay litigation. And then finally, we're going to close it out with our global um, pay equity desktop reference. It's going to give you additional insight about what's happening outside of the U.S. as well. So we're thrilled about all of those incredible resources. We get uh, questions about them and requests for them, and we update them at least annually. Some of the resources are updated quarterly, so please check back in with us. We try to keep all of our materials available to you on our um, equal pay or pay equity group um, website. So with that, we can dive into the substantive um, topics um, for today and sort of where we're headed. Um, when we think about the trends and what's happening across the board, I and mean, I don't, uh, it perhaps doesn't come as a surprise to you, but pay transparency is here to stay. There's really no other way to say it. Um, there are multiple avenues that agencies, stakeholders, um, you know, legislators 
are looking at um, requiring additional info information about compensation. It's taking multiple different um, approaches, all designed to get at the, pro the, the, um, the goal, right, of equal pay within our uh, workforces. Um, so we're going to talk today about some of these, some more in depth than others. Um, we'll spend some time talking about pay range disclosures and how that's coming in multiple um, ways, including outside of the U.S. We'll talk about pay reporting requirements, um, pay assessments um, at a high level, just, um, you know, that that really is a, a key component that's coming up in, in certain jurisdictions in terms of what they're expecting employers to already be doing. We'll touch on the salary history ban that probably is the first initiative that hit um, with California and has uh, sort of taken over. I would say it's one of the initiatives that most employers already have implemented. We're going to talk briefly about this expanded definition of what comparable work is because that is a key component. And then just at a high level, you know, the stakeholder activity continues, right? So we continue to see shareholder proposals um, for more, you know, expanded uh, pay transparency, um, requests, for example, for global median um, pay gap information, global adjusted um, pay gap information. Um, there are um, various um, stakeholders that put out um, scorecards on companies and will identify and literally give you a grade um, that, that has applied, I believe, to the, the top 100 um, companies that are out there these days, and they literally get um, a score associated with it. Um, employees um, are, are asking a lot about pay, continue to ask about pay, especially when we get to pay transparency um, and, you know, having pay ranges on job postings, and that provides more visibility to your internal workforce. Um, and so questions um, are often coming from um, you know, many different uh, stakeholders uh, across uh, the board. So as we get into the next section, we're going to start talking about, on the U.S. side, the U.S. pay transparency. Um, and, and we're really going to get into an overview of the current U.S. pay disclosure requirements. So you may be aware that many jurisdictions in the U.S. have um, pay transparency requirements already. Um, and, and they basically take the form, sort of three different forms. I'm about two slides ahead of you, um, Kate. Yeah, um, there's uh, kind of, they take sort of three forms. One is, is the requirement to provide a pay range right on the job posting? Um, other jurisdictions take a different approach and they'll say, okay, when someone requests it, you have to provide it, whether that's an applicant or an employee. And then there's others, and I put the others uh, in, a, in a different bucket because they are um, often, well, they're not required on the job posting themselves, but they're also not required only upon request. So, for example, um, Connecticut says you either have to provide it at, as of the time of the applicant's request or prior to the time of an offer of compensation. Other uh, jurisdictions require it right after the first interview that you might have with an individual. Um, so the states that do require it right on the posting, I think the newest one that's coming up soon, um, very soon, well, June 30th is coming, I guess, the soonest, right? So if you have um, postings in Washington, D.C., um, that will be the next um, uh, jurisdiction to require uh, pay ranges right on your job postings. Um, Illinois, though, is the next state that across the board is going to require um, posting, or uh, yeah, pay ranges right on the job postings, and that's going to be effective starting on January 1st of 2025. When we go on to the next slide, we just thought it would be helpful to take a look at this visually um, when we talk about the states with current um, disclosures, and obviously you'll see the Northeast is the one that has the most, although California and Washington have been quite aggressive in the way they have pushed out their pay requirements as well as Colorado. Colorado was, um, California has taken a few bites at the apple, so they are the ones that sort of started first with the salary history ban, um, and we've seen those requirements expand. When we go to the next slide, though, we took the same map and we just added a few more colors on here so that you can really see where that trend is happening. So we clearly do have pay transparency requirements in multiple jurisdictions. But here now you see what these additional kind of a, it's a, a um, medium 
purple color. The shading is a little bit um, not quite as highlighted there. Um, that's what's um, pending right now. And we're watching those uh, states quite closely to really understand what the requirements are. They are all falling in those same three buckets that I said. Most of them are requiring um, that pay transparency right on the job posting. So with that, we're gonna to go to the next um, topic or section, and we're gonna dive into paid data reporting requirements. Um, for the most part, we don't see significant changes here on the next slide. You'll see that we're, you know, California is one of the um, first that now they have two paid data reporting requirements. Um, most of you probably have already completed um, at least one or two pay reports in California. They continue to add additional components. So you're gonna be covering your actual employees, those that you, know, you, you cover. And then last year for the first time, they added what they're um, uh, labeling labor contractor employees. And these are workers that come alongside and perform services for the employer itself. Um, they are W-2 employees of another employer. So some of these are staffing agency companies, but not always. Um, the uh, California took a much broader definition of what it means to be a labor contractor employer, but these are essentially third party workers that come to your workforce and provide services within your usual course of business. And that um, is you know, pretty broad and quite vague because they add, in, you know, they're doing regular and customary work of, um, of the business. So anybody that comes alongside from a third party to do work in California is arguably a labor contractor employee that you as an employer have an obligation to gather information about that you do not currently have. So we all know they're paid by someone else, they're on somebody else's W-2, and yet California is gonna require you to provide data about those, uh, those workers um, that, are, that you're using within your workforce um, to, to, to carry out um, work. So that report um, on the next slide, we'll see that that is coming up due. Um, the next one is May 8th. So just a couple of months, um, less than a couple of months away. Um, it's a lot of data, especially that labor contractor report. If you're not aware of the labor contractor report or have questions about it, please reach out to us or your um, current counsel that you're using because that report is quite um, cumbersome um, to gather and collect information about because you're going to out to all of your vendors that may have provided services to you. The new reporting requirement for this year um, is that you also have to designate which of those workers, both your own employees as well as those um, that are coming to you from a labor contractor uh, employers, um, how many of them are working remotely? So how many of them um, don't work remotely? How many of them are located within California but report out? And then how many are reporting into California? It's a new data point that um, California CRD has sort of surprisingly, not sort of, surprisingly just added um, this year. Um, and it was a new uh, reporting requirement that we really did not see uh, coming um, before that was issued. So it is creating some complications, I will say that. Um, also, um, for labor contractors, last year they were able to just report on unknown information, and that requirement um, is, uh, no, is, is not, that, that sort of exception is no longer in effect, and, and contractors really do have to give you um, that information. On the next slide, you'll see, um, we've done like webinars um, specifically on Illinois pay reporting as well as California and others. Um, so I'm not gonna go into detail on them other than to say that if you have at least 100 workers in Illinois, um, you should have already or be filing your report by you know, just a few days, May 23rd of 2024. Uh, employers were given rolling deadlines um, to uh, comply with this information. Um, it, um, so, so if you don't already have that deadline in place, um, make sure you're reaching out because that is a really important um, compliance requirement. Whether you received a deadline or not, um, you're supposed to, under the statute, have all submissions have to be done by May 23rd of 2024. If you have already uh, uh, filed, um, so we had some employers that were lucky enough uh, to be that first one up in May of 2022 when they started doing these uh, collection requirements, they are already gearing up for their second reporting because it's a rolling every two year period. Um, 
that is employee level um, data that's being submitted, as well as um, you know, wage, uh, W-2 wages and hours information. The next slide is up there more um, as a takeaway. We are going to be sharing the slides. That is the information that employers are requiring to certify. And I draw your attention in particular to the, um, the two sort of sections around how often you do an analysis of wage determinations and how frequent um, you're analyzing whether or not your wages and benefits are evaluated to ensure compliance with the law. So those are two components um, and sort of my reference to um, engaging in ongoing assessment. Here you've got a state that's asking you to provide information, even though there's technically no legal requirement um, to do so. So that is a consideration uh, to keep in mind. Um, we do have in the march towards um, equal pay and pending legislation that we're dealing with, um, we do have on the next slide, you'll see uh, pending legislation that will include pay data reporting. Excuse me. Um, so several states do have pending legislation. You see them here. Um, so Massachusetts, New York, and Vermont would require pay data reporting. Um, so that is sort of the net, one of the trends that we identified in our early slide. Um, we do see more states, additional jurisdictions asking for um, compensation information. So far, what we're seeing is that these three jurisdictions would be unlike Illinois and would not require individualized employee level data. It's more along the lines of California and EEO1 style data that um, requires uh, W2 or some aggregate information. Um, again, publicly accessible in some format. These, again, are pending, so we don't have, I didn't want to go in too much detail other than to describe at a high level that this is, this is what we're seeing and trends that are coming um, for employers. I did want to give, a, 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 in the next section, a quick update on EEOC. And the EEOC, sort of on the federal level at the U.S., I'm on the next slide, you'll see, if you recall, several years ago, we had a couple of um, um, years where we had to provide W-2 um, data in some ways, or at least how the agency had set it up. And they recently, actually just um, this past week, or last week on Tuesday, um, a week ago, they released uh, some dashboard data. So at the bottom of this slide, you'll see um, that there's a link here. You can just go right on the EEOC's website if you don't have access to this to see what it is they are providing. And they made some conclusions about several categories um, of data. For example, I'm not going to go through all of them, but for example, um, they noted that in 2018, the national median pay band for men was one pay band higher than the median pay band for women. Um, and it's two uh, pay bands higher um, in, in 2017. Um, and the reason why that information is important is that, you know, there were many, many um, concerns and practitioners raised a lot of concerns about the methodology that the EEOC used. If you remember, this was um, it's, it's information that was put together by EEO1 job category. So, for example, all your professionals in an organization are going to have the same, um, they're going to be reported in the same level, and it's median pay data. At least part of it was median information, so it's, it's really um, sort of giving more insight and information about levels within an organization where people might be paid according, you know, in this case, for example, it, it did not take into account the actual hours, at least in the analysis, it didn't take the hours. So, for example, somebody that's working part-time is going to be compared in the same grouping as your full-time workers. So there was a lot of um, issues and concerns around component two, um, and yet there is a general expectation that we will see um, additional uh, requests um, from the EEOC for it, whether it looks exactly like component two or slightly different, but we do believe that is coming, and it's coming very, very soon. So as you'll see on the next slide, Charlotte, Charlotte Burroughs, the EEOC um, chair, um, you know, made some quotes in the statement that was released, right, uh, at a high level, just demonstrating that the dashboards demonstrate that pay disparities based on sex and race persist in almost every industry, both at the national level and in nearly every state. And then on the next slide, you'll see she said, making this aggregated data available to the public, 
shows how pay data collection can shine a light on the problem and potential solutions, followed by the EEOC remains dedicated to using all of our tools to combat pay discrimination and fulfill promises of equal opportunity. Um, there was a study that was done that the EEOC commissioned around the pay data that was received to have a better understanding of what might be um, used in the future. That report was already released. Um, they had some feedback around, especially around pilot, um, uh, you know, doing this as a pilot um, and, you know, identifying some pros, but also some real challenges with the data. Um, but, you know, generally speaking, this is a high, high priority area for EEOC. Um, I think the, the release of the um, data demonstrates, um, and certainly the statements released by the um, EEOC demonstrate that. On the very next slide, I just pulled one example of the dashboard. There's a lot of dashboards that, that are out there, and so you can pick and choose and put some date ranges around it. You can um, uh, filter to various industries based on the NAICS codes um, that are available, but you see this sort of trend, at least from a, from a depiction perspective, when you look at the median pay band by the various categories that each organization um, you know, submitted, and this is all aggregate information, how this all lands. It also um, sort of reveals um, something that, you know, EEO-1 reports are pretty routine um, that are done on an annual basis. Um, often, you know, compliance professionals just put this together. They used to be just counts, and it didn't matter so much, or at least perhaps many didn't think about the importance of is someone an executive or senior level manager under the EEOC's guidance, which is supposed to be those that are two levels away from the CEO versus if they're a first level official and manager. We have seen lots of confusion in terms of the data that companies have put together. Or for example, picking up terms like someone that's a project manager and just including them in the manager title. Compensation is very, very different, right? So it's one thing to put counts together and say this is how many of a particular group, but when you start adding compensation to it, it may um, reveal some issues that need to, you know, you need to take a closer uh, look on. That's another um, example of this use of median uh, pay band information that's out there. And then flipping on the next slide to um, federal contractors. So if you are a federal contractor, um, you may have seen that there are proposed um, changes to um, uh, that would apply to federal contractors, and it's really important um, to recognize a lot of a lot of employers don't tune out <laughs> so quickly and say, "Oh, I'm not a federal contractor," because this, um, the way that at least currently, at least how it's proposed, it would apply to any federal contracts or subcontracts that are um, being used, and it's the services or um, commercial services or products are um, at the ten thousand dollar level. And oftentimes we, you know, we have a kind of a $50,000 threshold in order to prepare these kind of expansive um, affirmative action programs. And so a lot of employers think, well, I don't have to worry about um, that requirement too much because underneath that threshold, it's really mostly non-discrimination and some job, uh, not sorry, not job postings, just some posters that are required or some notices. This would change that quite a bit. So unless there are changes, this would be required for anybody um, that has more than $10,000 um, in contracts. Um, so that could include a lot more employers than they might otherwise think. Um, we have comments due coming up April 1st that we are working through. Um, on the next slide, you'll see the key areas that this is covering. So compensation history ban. Um, there's some unique challenges or changes there that will impact uh, employers, so we want to uh, highlight that. Again, pay range disclosures. So, you know, we talked about on the state level and showed you where, what states actually have the requirements in place, as well as those that are pending. Now, if you add on top of that, if you're also a federal contractor at the $10,000 level or above, that's going to apply much, much in a much broader way. And you don't have to have a direct contract. This also flows down to your subcontracts as well. There's a notice provision to all your applicants that's required. There's contractual slowdown obligation language, as well as a complaint process that also kicks in. On the next slide, I'll, I'm just going to hit, I think, on the uh, first um, three areas just a bit. Um, so, for example, um, federal contractors would be um, prohibited from seeking um, 
uh, an applicant's compensation history. Um, requiring disclosure as, as a condition of candidacy as well as relying on it. Um, so, for example, if in most of the states or a lot of the states except for Illinois, um, if someone voluntarily discloses their compensation information to you as an employer, um, you can use that if it was voluntarily provided and it was done at a later time. There's some caveats to it, but essentially that's what most of the states um, require. However, um, here, um, uh, if the proposed um, regulations go into effect or the proposed rule goes into effect as currently drafted, you could not use that information at any stage of the process. And critically important is that the term applicant also applies to your existing employee workforce. So this is a situation where somehow you're not supposed to take into account your current employee's compensation. And many employers do have um, salary um, sort of um, thresholds. So if you're getting promoted into a new level, there might be a 10% or a 15% cap in terms of a promotional increase. And so the question would be, is that still going to be permissible under the new um, requirements, assuming that they go through as currently drafted? So that's a big, big change and a big issue. Um, on the next slide, I'll talk just a moment about the pay range disclosures. And this is um, supposed to be on all jobs postings that you're that are being offered, right, or you're making available um, for for positions working on or in connection with a federal contract in your job advertisements. Now, what that actually means, or how employers are supposed to figure out which jobs um, actually were were um, uh, posted that are in connection with um, the federal contract is going to be a pretty challenging proposition. But essentially, it would require um, salary uh, ranges that you, in good faith, believe you'll pay for the position, as well as a general description of, 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 um, of um, your other benefits and other forms of compensation. Comp is defined quite broadly, so it includes all your uh, benefits, um, you know, uh, equity, uh, bonus, all of that information would be uh, covered. Um, and you have the option, at least here, and we've seen a couple of the states giving you the option to use either the actual pay scale that you've identified for that position, the range of positions that you might have for others working in similar jobs, and then the amount budgeted. Um, on the next slide, you'll see that there's a requirement for, um, that would have to go to all your applicants, so you have to provide notice of the requirement to applicants, and it's prescribed language. Um, that you have to, you know, list in terms of the specific requirements, including how to file a discrimination complaint um, that has to be made available to your applicant. Um, the last slide or, that I'll touch on, at least, is the contract flow obligations. Um, there, also, you have to provide that information um, to your subcontractors that are providing um, workers to you or providing services to you. That information has to be shared with them as well. You have to include the substance um, in all of your um, subcontract uh, subco subcontracts with your um, with your vendors and suppliers. Um, there's one more slide here, just on the complaint um, process and how that works, but I'll leave that um, for the uh, materials as we definitely want to uh, start talking about the global landscape. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Caitlin. Thanks, Annette. Um, and hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, so we wanted to talk a little bit about what's happening globally. And just to start with a bit of an overview, um, some of the trends that we're seeing on the next slide. So we are seeing an increase in countries that have public or governmental disclosure requirements. Um, over time, there's been a shift. We saw uh, quite a few countries that had either internal analysis or reporting obligations. Um, some countries with optional reporting, for instance, they could put it on their website, but we're really seeing a trend towards having public and external disclosures. Um, and that's something that we think is probably going to continue to, to be the trend. Um, we're also seeing a trend in regions that are taking an interest in pay equity. Um, we'll discuss it a bit more um, later on, but what has been really kind of the hot button and hot topic area have been in the US and Europe, um, particularly in Europe as of late with the EU pay transparency directive. 
um, we haven't seen as many um, APAC or LATAM countries um, as on a regional basis uh, joining in on this trend, but we do think that may start to change. Um, in recent years, we've also seen an emphasis on diversity and inclusion training in the workforce um, composition data as well. You know, when we talk about pay equity reporting and disclosure and any sort of resulting compliance that stems from that, often what the report says and, and whether you're compliant is often as, is really only as good as the data that the company can produce. Um, and so oftentimes that we see that, you know, companies having to produce such data is really driving them to take a closer look at their, their workforce composition. Um, and to that end, we're also seeing related laws aimed at increasing pay equity in the workplace um, and really leveling the playing field for applicants as well. It's not just about um, employees. Um, it's also really taking an interest in applicants and candidates as well. And finally, we're seeing an increased interest and really pressure from stakeholders on these equity issues. So regulators, shareholders, investors, clients, these stakeholders are looking for accountability when it comes to pay equity. Um, and we anticipate that this scrutiny is only going to continue um, to gain momentum as public disclosure requirements become more widespread and robust. Um, and in the same vein, investors are also increasingly using ESG criteria um, as a set of standards to evaluate companies that they may want to invest in. And one of those areas is pay equity. So investors are becoming increasingly conscious of whether companies that they invest in are being socially responsible and managed in accordance with the proper governance. Um, and this we're seeing is particularly true with regard to uh, gender equity um, and pay equity. Um, with that, my colleague Anna will talk a little bit more on the next slide um, about these trends. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, so, as Caitlin was explaining, there has been already quite a lot of legislation being implemented in the different countries, and we see a little bit of concentration in certain regions like we have in EMEA. But the biggest development that we've seen over the last year in 2023, um, I think it would be the um, approval of the European Directive on Pay Transparency. And there were already quite a lot of countries in Europe that have their own uh, local regulations into, that provided for uh, pay reporting obligations or, you know, um, pay transparency, but with this um, directive, uh, we believe it's obviously going to change the landscape and the trend uh, is likely to continue to other countries, uh, including other regions. The other big development that we've seen in terms of countries introducing new legislation on this area is Brazil, that also last year implemented a new um, legislation that provided for, you know, uh, pay reporting obligations that are addressed by um, gathering data from uh, um, the salary information that is reported to the government agencies. And through all the regulations that are already approved and the upcoming ones, so like the directive that is already in place, but it's going to be implemented by the, the member states, uh, we see some trends and, and I'm it, I'm sure some of them will will sound familiar to what Annette was just describing for the US, which um, is the first of all, um, it's the, the limits on the ability to ask for salary history. Um, so, you know, the, the the question that was commonly asked in pretty much every country, this is um, regarding the salary history of the candidate is now being limited by these new uh, legislations that are being implemented. Um, also, this information on the salary reporting um, and whether there's a gap, it's been made public, um, not only by obligation to notify to the government or to the labor authorities, but also the obligation for the companies to publish that inf such information in their websites. Um, and so it will be accessible also for candidates, not only for current employees or employees' representatives. And that leads me to the other trend, a new trend, and I'm going to stop here a little bit more, which is when there is a gap being identified, uh, there is an obligation in most of these legislations to um, implement some sort of remediation or to provide some um, 
explanations and part of the remediation often goes through discussing what the solution looks like or the remedies looks like with unions or employee representatives. And the reason I said I was going to stop a little bit is because, you know, some of you that are very used to dealing with employees in Europe, what might be very familiar with this, but those who are not, um, it is very common uh, to have these employee representation obligations uh, for European companies in the way of a works council or other form of representation, uh, which means that a lot of the topics that the employer is dealing with in the company, and this is a big one, the pay transparency and pay reporting obligations, um, they have to not only inform, but also consult and sometimes even reach an agreement uh, before implementing any measures. So you need to take into account the employee representative's opinion and factor what they want to do, because sometimes you you have to uh, reach an agreement with them. And this is not exclusive for Europe, although it's, it's actually quite uh, strong there, but you will see other countries where you would have to discuss also with employees your representatives or union. Um, and then finally, these legislations also include the notion of what is uh, equal pay for equal job for equal work, which was the traditional definition. Now it is developing in this new trends to equal pay for equal work of equal value. And what that work of equal value means, it's being defined by the different legislations. And we see, and we're going to see if we move to the next slide, we're going to see a little bit more in detail how this is defined uh, by the European directive. Uh, but um, if you look at other countries, um, they're going to have a different implementation uh, or different definition of what work of equal value means. So in terms of the EU Transparency Directive, this is the Directive 2023-970 that, um, that is dated 10 May 2023. And the purpose of this directive is to strengthen, and I'm reading through the title of the directive, to strengthen the application of the principle of equal pay for equal work or work of equal value between men and women through pay transparency, transparency and enforcement mechanisms. So this is applicable to all the members of the European Union, the EU, and this includes 27 member countries. Um, the directive, although it provides a timing for it to be implemented, which is June 2026, um, the truth is that uh, it kind of has it kind of have some guiding principles, but as any other directive, but the, the implementation goes through the member states, the countries part of the EU, EU approving local country regulations to implement these principles. And what that means is that we're going to see the countries implementing the directive in different ways. So we'll have to wait and see what each country approves. And if, as we've seen in the previous slide, there were so a lot of the countries that were part of the EU already had um, laws, local laws in this topic, and we're going to provide to be uh, some examples later on, but um, those local regula regulations might be more um, restrictive or less, but they will have to adjust and whatever is more beneficial for the employees, they can prove so they can go a bit farther to the directive and provide more information or provide more obligations. They can, they, but they have to obviously accept the minimum that it's implemented in the directive. And the only other comment in terms of um, the application of this is that geographically there will be other countries in Europe that are not part of the EU, like UK is the uh, typical example, or Switzerland. Uh, they also, we've seen it in the previous slide, they already had some pay reporting obligations. Um, so even though they will not be directly impacted by the directive, they, they are already, you know, within this trend in Europe of implementing these um, new regulations on this area. And finally, in terms of the um, no notion of what is the work of equal value, what the directive says is that there needs to be pay structures that enable the assessment um, on whether the employees are in a comparable situation based on objective gender neutral criteria agreed with the worst council. So going back to the discussion with the employee representatives, this work of equal value should be agreed with the worst council, uh, shouldn't be based on gender and should include things like skills, working conditions, efforts, responsibilities, and other factors that are relevant to the job. And what the directive also flags that I think it's interesting is that soft skills, soft skills should not be undervalued. 
So we are, you know, we'll have to wait and see how the member states implement this definition of work of equal value and how this is being interpreted in the different countries. And with that, um, I'm going to move on to Caitlin to explain in the next slide a little bit more of what these obligations under the directive um, are being introduced, uh, what these obligations look like. So, as Anna mentioned, the directive is focused on achieving equal pay for equal work or work of equal value. Um, and so what we wanted to talk about here was some highlights. And again, I think it's really important to bear in mind that these are principles, but every member country is responsible for implementing their own laws. And so while the directive has kind of very um, clear cut in some respects um, principles, any country could say that they're going to do something that's actually more prescriptive or um, even more burdensome even for employers. And so I think when we look at this lens of highlights, we have to keep that in mind. So one of the areas that the uh, pay transparency directive covers is prior to employment. What about job applicants? And under the directive, job candidates will be able to seek pay information from their potential employers in the application process. That information will be relating to initial salary or um, range of salary, um, and also information about the applicable collective agreements that are applied by the employer. Um, they will also be able to um, have information presented in a way that facilitates informed pay negotiations, um, and possibly by incorporating that into the job posting before the interview. Um, so that's something that is kind of a watch out area as these uh, countries start to implement their own laws. Um, there's also under the directive, uh, the principle that employers can't ask about candidates salary history. So you may be seeing a trend here. This is, these are kind of some of the principles that we see it happening in the US in terms of job posting and salary ranges, asking about salary history. And so this is, uh, this trend and the, these principles are kind of enshrined in this directive as well. The next kind of big bucket is about employees and workers' rights to information. So once an applicant's past the job application stage and they become an employee, um, and for all employees that uh, have been there, there are really broad rights for employees with respect to paid transparency. So for example, um, employers with 50 or more workers um, will need to ensure that employees have easy access to the criteria that's used to determine pay, pay levels, and pay progression. Um, workers will also have a right to request and receive written information about their individual pay level, um, as well as average pay levels categorized by gender or categories of workers performing the same work as them or work of equal value. So you can see that this is really quite wide ranging um, and also leaves a lot of room for interpretation. And that's what we expect to see once individual countries start putting laws on the books. Um, so what this will actually look like in practice. Uh, another principle in this bucket is with respect to employers actually needing to inform workers about their right to seek that information and how they can go about getting the information. A third bucket that we look at is uh, reporting obligations. Um, and what we have on um, the slide here, you can see there's different buckets in terms of number of employees and when reports will be due and how often, whether annually or every three years. But again, to go back to what we spoke about at the outset of this slide, this is the requirement under directives. And so country laws may actually impose different requirements. So for example, in Spain, the threshold re for reporting is 50 employees. Um, and that obviously is much more burdensome on um, employers than what's prescribed here under the directive. So um, kind of keep going back to this principle of the directive has kind of the framework, but each individual country will ultimately uh, implement their own laws and so um, it'll be important to follow those laws as they come out, as well as the laws that are already on the books and potentially how they may change uh, to align with the directive. 
Um, the directive does also outline information that will need to be contained in reporting, um, which includes kind of a laundry list of information, but some of the highlights include um, the gender pay gap within the company. Um, that includes pay gap information specific to variable pay components. And so we're not just looking, for instance, at base remuneration, but bonuses as well, as well as any sort of other commissions um, or other pay components would be considered as well. Um, reporting will consider median gender pay gap, um, and that's defined as the difference between the median pay level of female and median pay level of male workers um, expressed as a percentage. The data also includes proportion of female and male workers receiving those variable components. So again, really looking at entire comp packages. Um, there will also be reporting about categories by worker. So broken down by basic wage or salary, as well as those variable components. Um, this is not an exhaustive list, but it's intended to give you a sense of the detail that the directive calls for. Um, and it is quite a bit of data that companies are gonna have to start considering uh, recording and keeping track of if they're not doing it already. Um, Anna had touched on this as well, um, but the directive also calls for consulting with workers' representatives on the accuracy of the information in those reports, um, as well as the methodologies used to arrive at the reported information. Um, and so for those that are familiar with um, employee reps and trade unions and works councils in Europe, this can end up being a, a, a fairly significant obligation. Um, in terms of where the report information ends up, uh, under the directive, the principle is that employers can choose to publish the information publicly, but they will also need to provide the information to the appropriate monitoring authority. That's going to be country specific. Um, data from the last four years will also be required to be made publicly available by the, the various monitoring authorities. Uh, and workers, workers' representatives, and labor inspectorates will also have the right to ask employers for clarifications and additional details re regarding any of that reported data. And I, I mean, I think the big takeaway here is that there's a lot of data that will need to be collected and analyzed by companies, and the outcome of that data collection and analysis is going to be out there. It's going to be public, um, not only within the workplace um, amongst employees and worker representatives, but also with respect to government regulators and equality bodies that are um, established or have already been established um, in the, the member countries. Um, and one other piece to consider is the potential for a joint pay assessment. So if certain conditions are met and really this um, these conditions indicate that maybe there is a lack of pay equity, um, employers will need to conduct a joint pay assessment with their worker representatives. So this is, for instance, if pay reporting is showing a minimum of 5% difference in average pay between male and female workers, employer fails to justify the difference based on objective gender neutral criteria, and the employer does not rectify that unjustified pay gap within six months from submission of the pay reporting. Um, so this is really a remedy to those a, a less favorable outcome. Um, so from an employer perspective, it, it really acts, I think, as an incentive to get it right and ensure that um, you don't run into this problem if at all possible, because there's um, a great deal of kind of communication with the, the joint assessment, um, as well as information that has to be exchanged and shared. Um, and so it, it does become um, something that companies will need to think about from not only a, a data collection per perspective, but time and budgetary constraints as well. Um, and going even further, the directive does include the principle that employers should share that joint pay assessment with workers, their representatives, and the relevant monitoring authority for the member state. Um, and so again, this really just goes to the trend of very clear and open disclosure. Um, so it's it's not a situation where companies are going to be able to do the assessment and internally say, hey, we have a problem, we need to fix this. It is going to be um, really probably a lot more public than perhaps it had been um, in in previous years. Um, 
with that, I'll turn it back to Anna to talk about the next slide about what you can do now to think about preparing as this directive um, takes shape amongst the, the member countries. I think you're on mute, Anna. Sorry, that still happens. Um, so, yeah, you're right that the, the directive is there and we're going to see a lot of countries introducing new regulations in the next couple of years in order to implement the directive. There's a few things that employers can still do now to prepare. Uh, first one is obviously um, anticipate the head, the head count that you have in the different member states and the different EU countries and see if you reach the threshold that triggers the obligations. But not only current head count, but also planned, like you're planning to grow in this country and have more employees and you would be included into the scope of the regulation. Regulation. Also, look at the regulations that are already in place, because as we said, this is going to be implemented different in the different countries, particularly in those that already had a regulation. It might be that they take the, the previous approach by applying these to the lower threshold. Um, consider the internal budgets for the analysis, the internal audit that you need to execute, and also to comply with the reporting obligations and all the joint committee or remediation um, uh, measures that you might need to take. I would say it doesn't, it wouldn't harm to take, to start doing the analysis and identify if there's any gap in order to prepare, because as we've been discussing, this is going to be subject to consultation with uh, workers representatives. So it, it's a good idea to start getting prepared for that and be able to analyze the data and see if there's any, any area of concern where you should be focusing and obviously monitor each country. I mean, keep on monitoring the, the approval of the different local legislations as part of the implementation of the directive. And then moving on to the next slide, um, we're going to go through a few examples of the existing obligations in the um, existing regulations in different countries. And, you know, there's plenty of it and we don't want to go into a lot of detail because this would be subject to a different webinar, um, the whole going country by country, we don't have time. But, you know, UK, I think is the, the first example that comes to light in this topic. It's probably the most mature country, uh, having a legislation providing for equal pay for equal work. and also the gender pay uh, gap reporting for companies with more than 250 employees. It's more sort of a reputational factor that companies take into account when they publish this information out there and then companies are being considered as part of that. Um, Caitlin France. Yeah, from the France perspective, um, it'll be interesting to see how the directive impacts what is already on the books in France. Right now, the requirement is for employers to measure the gap based on four or five indicators, whether four or five applies is based on company size. Um, but essentially, it's an index of these um, various factors and companies look at them. Um, it, they include the gap of in individual salary increases, promotion gap, um, similar, uh, similar data points, and then um, are published um, online by the companies. So, you know, it's, it's something that's on the books and a requirement now, but I think we'll probably uh, maybe impacted by the directive. Yeah, for Spain, it, the, it, has a quite detailed legislation already in place. There's this obligation when companies have more than 50 employees to have the equity, equity plans. And within these plans, there's an obligation to make a salary audit and the salary audit includes a job position evaluation. And there's a tool that was published by the Ministry of Labor defining what the evaluation, the evaluation, the work position evaluation needs to look like in order to conclude what is the work of equal value. Uh, to make the comparable assessment, uh, but the salary record is mandatory for all companies. It is not the threshold of 50 employees. Any company in Spain would have to have the salary record that it um, needs to aggregate the salary data uh, per job, per group, professional group, uh, identifying male and female. So the directive is going to include some new obligations, particularly in terms of publicity. Uh, and also the salary history, but it's quite developed on this topic. It wouldn't have a lot of additional obligations for companies operating in Spain. And in Germany right now, the obligation um, applies to employers with more than 500 employees. So that's certainly something that's going to be a change. Um, and uh, the reporting timing is definitely going to be a change as well. Right now, it's every five years for employers with um, a collective bargaining agreement and uh, every three for others. 
Um, and so we think that there's going to be more development here, um, particularly with respect as well to um, the enforcement of, of women's rights to information about pay of their male colleagues. Um, Italy already had some reporting obligations for companies over 100 employees, so this is more aligned with them. Uh, some of the thresholds of the directive, and it was every two years containing information about the remuneration and the report has to be shared with the government and also union representatives. And as another example in Australia, obviously outside of the EU, um, also has a, a fairly robust um, law on the books already. Um, Australia certainly would not be impacted by the EU directive, but um, it has been kind of working towards this uh, kind of similar uh, uh, requirements in terms of reporting. Um, and in fact, employers in Australia do have to report on specific data points um, and depending on the number of employees meet certain minimum standards, including having a policy or strategy um, to support gender equality. This year, for the first time, the um, regulating agency there released company names and their respective data on pay equity. Um, and so I think this is something that we will probably see a bit more once the laws related to the directive go into effect. Um, but it did have an effect of having some bad publicity for certain larger corporations um, when that that pay equity data was uh, was released. Um, and then the final example is Canada. Canada has this provincial system, so every province will have different regulations. Uh, Quebec and Ontario already had the pay reporting obligations. And then this last year, 2023, a new regulation has been approved for British Columbia, including the obligation to report um, the salary record as part of the pay equity declaration. And this applies, uh, this is going to be in, uh, apply in different stage, starting in November 2024 for companies with more than 1,000 employees. And then we're going to move on to the um, final topic, which is the strategies for global compliance. So I know we're short on time, so I'll move through this quickly, but I think, you know, we've talked a lot about what is required, but then the kind of real key question is, how do companies make sure that they are actually compliant with their obligations? And so we had touched on this previously, but companies staying on top of their headcounts, and understanding what jurisdictions that they operate in actually have these laws, um, that is that is really kind of the key first, first question, uh, making sure that companies know where do I have obligations. And then once the there's an understanding of where do we have our obligations, it's a question of what are the obligations. You know, as you've seen from these examples, different countries do have different obligations. And so it's important to keep track of what is relevant for the jurisdictions in which a company operates. And so this includes the data points that actually need to be tracked, what needs to be reported, um, the timing and cadence of those reports, whether those reports are internal, for instance, publishing on a company's website, or need to be reported into a government regulator. Um, similarly, whether the company needs to actually put together and submit a report itself or whether the government compiles the data and prepares and publishes a report based on data that it has um, from companies submitting directly to it. Um, and then, of course, that critical piece of understanding whether the company will have obligations to consult with employee reps um, and ensuring that adequate time is dedicated to this step of the process. With that, I will turn it back over to Annette. Okay, fantastic. So, you know, if, if we don't impress anything else on you um, at this point, I, I think um, we've highlighted the trends, um, the key trends, certainly, and, you know, just coming with this idea of, you know, new, new uh, legislation, new regulations that really are going to force the issue of greater and greater pay transparency. Um, is critical. So that means that as an employer, you're going to have to set the strategies um, overall with regard to your compensation. On the next slide, you'll see quickly, I believe, um, you'll see this um, comparable work or similarly situated work um, that Anna um, talked about on the next slide. Um, it'll have this, the, you know, kind of what we see on the federal side, and that was equal pay for equal work. We saw states moving away from that to a substantially similar standard. And then um, Anna talked a lot about what is happening in the EU. And so because of that, employers are really, you're gonna have to think through 
your overall pay structure, your overall, what do you define as an organization as work that is substantially similar or comparable? That is gonna be a game changer in litigation that comes forward um, in terms of some of the pay reporting requirements that you're gonna have. And before we go any further, let me give you the um, uh, um, CLE code, which is SS1467, that's SS1467. Um, and then just keeping uh, uh, going forward with some of the strategies and, and as uh, Caitlin said, getting it right, right? Having your own strategy for how you uh, consider um, the work that is comparable is going to be important. And I will honestly say that oftentimes this is going to be um, work that you get assistance with. So in addition to coming up and getting market data and all of that information that could be helpful, really defining and having a robust, comprehensive structure within your organization that looks at job families and how you're grouping them. Um, what your pay grades or your, or your um, you know, market data that you might be applying across the board, because plaintiffs will take that data and say, well, if you are paying, if this, is, if this individual is, a, you know, kind of a professional and this is their pay grade, that should be the pay for all jobs that are similar. And how you will be able to respond um, and address that is uh, really going to be important. We've, we've provided some information here in the next few slides that I'll let you um, go through, but it is critically important to really think through and have a strategic approach um, to your compensation practices and information. We thank you so much for joining us. Please be on the lookout for the additional resources that we will share with all of the attendees um, in the next day or so. Um, they'll be coming along with the uh, deck so that you'll have that information as well as the additional resources. Thank you so much for attending.